Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I am your host, back in the Sunflower House. I'm Dr. Holly Thacker, the Executive Director of National Speaking of Women's Health. And I am so happy to welcome guest, certified nurse practitioner, Dana Lynn Leslie. And I've often said I wish Dana was one of my daughter-in-laws. I only have one unmarried son, so I guess there is still hope. And Dana is just fabulous. She works with our Center for Specialized Women's Health team at the Cleveland Clinic. And um, she sees patients every day right alongside uh, with me. And I see Dana myself for my uh, annual exams. I think that's enough personal information. But (laughs) she's just fabulous. And she sees and we share lots of patients in common. Now, Dana Leslie um, has her undergraduate degree from Youngstown State University. She went on a full ride volleyball. She is a complete athlete. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, then she went on and got her graduate degree uh, in being a nurse practitioner from the University of Cincinnati. And she is a certified family nurse practitioner, and her focus is exclusively on women's health and our Women's Health Institute. So welcome, Dana. Tell us a little bit more about you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think you covered a lot of the high points there. Yes, I did my undergrad at Youngstown State University. I had a great experience there. I've been at the clinic for a little over 12 years now. Um, I worked in internal medicine for a few years, and I had a little stint in the cardiac ICUs, and then I went back to school and fell in love with women's health. So that landed me in your amazing practice. And um, yeah, I really like sports and traveling and taking care of patients. So Yeah, and you do a great job. And did you just get back from an exciting uh, road trip? You're always on the road when you're not working. I did. I got back last night. Um, I went to St. Louis to see the arch because I'm kind of a national park. um, I'm obsessed with the national park. So that's been my goal to see as many as I can in the last few years. Yeah, I love seeing pictures of you hiking and all these gorgeous photos like when you were out in Arizona and you took your mom all the way back home. You are such a great daughter. (laughs) <laughs> oh, my mom. She's my little best friend. Um, we had a great time. Yeah, she was staying with my sister lives in Arizona. She was staying with her for a few months in the winter. And then I drove her back because she won't fly the dog. So it was an experience. I bet. I bet. Well, tell us a little bit about um, what um, the what a certified nurse practitioner does, what the training is, and like what patients should consider um, seeing a CNP. Uh, Absolutely. So CMPs are considered mid-level providers. We are trained to assess, diagnose, interpret lab tests, as well as imaging, and also prescribe medications based on treatment plans. Um, As far as which, when should patients see a nurse practitioner, I feel like that varies between practices. Um, In our practice specifically, I get to see a lot of patients that are seeing you for their hormone replacement therapy. I do their exams for them to make the most of their time coming downtown to main campus. Um, You're so busy with your practice and so many women that need help with their uh, postmenopausal concerns that it's nice to give up some, be able to let you have some time back to see more patients so that I get to do all their exams. Um, I also and I really see, appreciate that, and I know our patients do too, and our schedulers many times do them back to back. Yeah, it's it's a great um, way to get a bunch of things done in one day for patients and to make their trip downtown worthwhile. Um, and I think in other practices, nurse practitioners are used uh, differently. Um, a lot of people they are their primary care, and they patients would see them for all of their concerns. Um, A lot of in our practice, you know, if they're having a lot of issues or need adjustments in medications, then they see you or whoever initially prescribed them their medications or prescriptions. And then for all of their routine care and refills of medications and maintenance things, they can come see myself. And and talk about like when people need an annual exam, because I think a lot of patients sometimes mix up the need for preventive care with a problem visit. Obviously, there's insurance coding issues. Um, Medicare generally only covers for an annual gynecologic wellness every two years. You know, some some of those those points that kind of help orient women. Absolutely. So there is a large difference between completing a pelvic exam and completing a pap smear. So a lot of patients get um, a little mis 
are confused on the difference between the two. Like, oh no, someone did a pelvic exam last year, but the guidelines changed um, even since I started getting um, annual exams done on when we do complete pap smears and uh, um, things like that. So not every year you do get a pap smear, but I, we do recommend for you to get an annual or have um, the vaginal tissue looked at yearly, depending on what you're getting treated and things like that. But it is recommended for you to have a pelvic exam yearly. Um, the coding, yes, is different depending on insurance and what they will and will not cover, which we have figured out how to um, figure that one out on our own. Um, so yeah, there, the, I do agree that they should get an exam every year, but that does not mean that they're going to get a PAP every year. And um, I think that is so important that, that women understand that just because they're getting an exam, maybe because they have an infection or you have to check their muscle tone or you have to look at the health of the vagina or potentially do a bimanual exam and a rectal exam and discuss colorectal cancer. Uh, screening that that's not the same as cervical cancer screening and I think that now that we're spacing out the pap smears there's a lot of people falling through the cracks so how do you manage um, cervical cancer screening in in your practice so I typically do pap smears every three years the guidelines technically say you can wait till five but I've seen a lot of things between three and five and I like to treat my patients as I would treat myself I want them done sooner than later especially if insurance is going to cover it um, so I always give my patients the option if they don't want to get it done that time or at that year, then they don't have to. They can wait till the five-year mark, um, but I do recommend every three years. If they've had an abnormal in the past, I like them to do a yearly pap at least every year for three years in a row to make sure that those three paps are normal. And if those are normal, then we can go back to routine screening and guidelines. If the pap smears are abnormal, um, we work very closely with Dr. Sharon Sutherland, and she does a lot of our like additional testing. She does the colposcopies and the LEAP procedures, uh, along with um, um, a lot of different clinicians at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, I, we just work with her very closely, and she does a great job of helping educate patients prior to. So she's very big on allowing them to do a virtual visit with her first to get more comfortable, which I think is very important um, to make sure that patients have that understanding of exactly what they're going to be going through prior to any type of procedure, which I think is a great benefit. And you see some of her post-LEAP and post-colposcopy patients and work very closely with her. Yes, I do. I get to see all the post-LEAPs um, like four to six weeks afterwards to make sure that everything's healing appropriately. And then they come back in six months for their repeat PAPs to myself and then for a yearly PAP after. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And um, you also offer uh, some virtual uh, telemedicine as well. So tell me how you integrate that into your practice of supporting the center in terms of doing annual exams and annual hormone and contraceptive reevaluations. Um, yeah, I love my little virtual afternoon. On Thursday afternoons, I do virtual appointments for patients that maybe don't need an exam that year or have different questions regarding medications or something like that, or the symptoms they're experiencing, and they don't feel like coming all the way downtown to main campus. So um, especially like we talked about with the insurance purposes of things, if they are not going, if Medicare or Medicaid isn't going to um, allow them to get an exam that year and they just need a refill and they don't need a PAP and everything's been normal over the past X amount of years, then it's appropriate for them to do in a virtual appointment, make sure everything's going okay, make sure there weren't any changes in their health care in the past year to get refills of medications. Um, and then we like to see them in the office at least every two to three years, make sure we get an accurate blood pressure if they're not in the Cleveland Clinic system so we can put our eyes on the patient and make sure that they're doing okay um, besides seeing them virtually through the screen. And you also do several gynecologic procedures um, most notably um, IUD insertions, and you also do Nexplanon, is that right? And some endometrial biopsies. Yes, and, I do a lot. Of so tell us a little bit about IUDs. I know you wrote a great column on IUDs on speakingofwomenshealth.com, and we're talking to nurse practitioner Dana Leslie, who works in the Center for Specialized Women's Health with your host, uh, Dr. Holly Thacker, and I was just mentioning uh, Dana's excellent column on intrauterine devices and intrauterine systems and the fact that um, this is one of her areas of expertise. So what is an IUD? Um, an IUD is a small T-shaped device that is inserted into the uterus to prevent pregnancy and to prevent cervical or, um, abnormal bleeding and endometrial issues. And there's there are... Um, 
I'm sorry. Yeah, there's non-hormonal and uh, hormonal. So you want to talk about those differences and the different types. Absolutely, yes. There are. There is one non-hormonal IUD called the Paragard. It is a copper IUD. Um, a lot of women will pick this one if they feel like they are very affected by any type of hormone. Um, it's good for 10 years to prevent pregnancy. It doesn't do anything as far as bleeding goes. It actually can make your cycles worse for the first six months while your body adjusts to a foreign body being in it. And then afterwards, cycles typically go back to normal. Um, but it is good for 10 years in prevention of pregnancy. And then there are the hormonal options, which are the Mirena, the Liletta, the Kylena, and the Skyla, which are all, they all have the same hormone in it, the levonorgestrel hormone, but they all are different based on size and length of time that they're able to be used. And which one do you insert the most? I say our patients get inserted the Mirena probably the most, which is larger in size, but it's good. It's um, pregnancy prevention for eight years, abnormal bleeding, FDA approved for five. It has the most hormone in it, and it has the 52 milligrams of the hormone, and um, it's FDA approved for eight years. Um, most patients report that they have a lot less in of bleeding, if not completely lose their, lose their cycles all the way while they have the IUD inserted. A lot of patients that I see when we do IUD checks have just some spotting with that IUD in particular. Um, but yeah, that's probably the most popular. It doesn't always work for everybody because if you have not had children before, you may not have a uterus that's, or you may not in general have a uterus that can fit the size of that Mirena IUD. So some women it doesn't, it's not appropriate for, but there's a different process in measuring and whatnot to figure out if that's appropriate for which patient. Well, as a menopause expert, seeing a lot of perimenopausal women and women are always happy generally not to bleed. It's one less hassle in your life and less need to replace iron, which sometimes can be challenging. And that was actually my first podcast on iron because that's so important for women. And there's so many different reasons why uh, females can be low in iron. Um, but with no menses, if someone feels fine, it still doesn't mean that you don't know what their hormones are. So I really think it should be more standardized, particularly after age 40, if there's no bleeding, to do yearly um, hormonal levels. Now, the question I get most frequently is, is insertion painful? And is there anything that you do to try to lessen that discomfort? Absolutely. That's the million dollar question for anybody that's considering an IUD. It's probably the most common question that's asked. And the way I describe it to patients that everybody has a different pain tolerance. There's plenty of patients that do absolutely well with it. Some women will have some cramping. Prior to them coming in, we do prescribe a medication called Cytotec, which we have them take two days prior to the IUD insertion and the night before to help dilate or soften the cervix to make the insertion process easier for the clinician doing it as well as the patient. Um, I also recommend for them to take ibuprofen prior to coming in and to make sure they eat a small meal because some women can feel like they get a little lightheaded or dizzy and sometimes some food can help with that and negate that problem. And do you have any special recommendations about them periodically checking the string once a month after their menses or uh, being concerned about expulsion or malplacement of the IUD? Absolutely. Um, you know, the package inserts do recommend for you to check your IUD at least every month. I recommend for patients to come in a month after they get their IUD inserted. A lot of practitioners now, depending on the state laws and regulations, will have women use backup protection until they do an ultrasound in a month to make ensure that the IUD is in the correct place if the, per, the whole purpose of them having the IUD is pregnancy prevention, just to ensure that it's in the correct location to, to make sure that they aren't able to get pregnant. Um, they, uh, it just depends on exactly what the purpose of them getting it is and what they're doing it for. So do you routinely do post-insertional um, uh, ultrasounds or only if there's a problem? Only if there's a problem, typically. But uh -huh. I do want them to come back for an IUD check. Um, a lot of women, depending on which way your cervix is tilted or where it's located, it can be really hard and difficult to find those strings, um, depending on exactly where it's located. So I do want them to come back at least in a month to get those checked. And certainly if you cut the string off too short, I've seen a couple of cases of the uh, male partner getting poked. So... <laughs> 
Yeah, and there's a lot of women that come in and they have the complaint of, well, my partner says that he can feel it. And um, I think that's an interesting uh, statement for a lot of men to say. But also I let them know if we cut it too short, the process of removing the IUD then when it comes to that time is a lot more difficult than it would be if we can actually like visualize the strings um, easily on an exam. And I find that since the IUD is generally well tolerated, people don't have to think about it once it's in, particularly if their periods are light or non-existent, uh, a lot of times people just ignore the time guidelines or don't even pay attention to the time it's inserted. Now, we have it in our electronic medical record, but we see people from all over, and a lot of the electronic records don't communicate. And I just think that, do you tell your patients to put it in their cell phone or to keep a little card in their purse or a little bit of both you know everybody has a smartphone nowadays so i make have them if you have an apple iphone you have the health maintenance um, app on there automatically that allows you to insert medications and um, other things like that so you always have it noted i also want them to take a picture of the card just so that they make sure that they have it and save it away somewhere in a file that they'll forget about but when they need it it's at hand and available or to put it in a wallet or a purse. But I mean, as often as a lot of women change those things, who knows where that may get lost. So I think the picture <laughs> is the most appropriate or um, putting it in your notes in your phone or something that can get continued carry on through the years. Because um, I, I have seen several instances where someone's had an IUD in for 10 or 15 or 20 years and um, then trying to remove them can be difficult if it embeds in the uterine wall or if the string just disintegrates. And then we have to send them, you know, for hysteroscopic or, or DNC removal. And so that's why I just think that um, it's great that we're able to make things easier for busy women, spacing out sometimes the PAPs if someone's over 30 and their HPV test is negative uh, or women by age 65 if they've always had normal PAPs and they don't have HIV AIDS and they, their mother didn't take DES and they don't have any other risk, they still need periodic pelvic exams every few years, but not the scrape of the cervix. But I think that because we've spaced a lot of things out and made things easier, um, it's almost gotten just a little bit too comfortable. That's just my bias. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or go search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. I agree. And I, you know, especially with the menopausal patients that we see, there's often patients when we ask them about intercourse and a lot of women aren't having it because they, they say that they just lack the their libido or they're not interested. But a lot of times women don't want to admit that it's painful because their vaginal tissue is so thin and dry. And there's options that we have to treat that and we can negate those problems for them so that they continue to have intercourse um, without the pain and all the issues that they had been having that has prevented them from having it in the meantime. So there's a lot of information that you can get on, on a complete pelvic exam. And one of the advantages from my perspective as a menopause specialist of using one of the levonorgestrel hormonal IUDs is that when the woman starts to dip her estrogen levels, get night sweats or hot flashes, you can just add an estrogen patch and you already have the uterine protection as long as that IUD is in there. Um, our functional medicine colleague, Dr. Khan, was just telling me the other day, because I had a patient who had a very high copper level, and she said, oh, sometimes I've, she's seen that in, in the Paragard. So I wonder, do you ever check copper levels? I just did on one of my patients who had a Paragard, and sure enough, her level was elevated. Really? No, I have not checked that routinely. There's different questions that I ask if they have any like diseases that are copper intolerant that we don't put those, suggest those IUDs for at that time. But no, I haven't checked a copper level. That's interesting. Um, maybe I should add that into my IUD, my Paragard people's <laughs> practice. <laughs> so um, I, I've just been checking a lot more zinc levels just in the age of you know COVID. Low zincs aren't good for lots of reasons. Some women have mood symptoms and depression. So I've, I've kind of been linking sometimes the, uh, the zinc and the copper can, can be uh, uh, inversely 
related. Now, we do see a lot of high-risk women for breast and ovarian cancer because um, we have such a big genomics institute, and our Center for Specialized Women's Health is right next to the breast center where they see a lot of high-risk women. And because long-acting reversible contraceptive agents like um, IUDs um, and like uh, the Nexplanon, which I'll have you talk about next, uh, are very effective, but they don't s always suppress ovulation. And so I really personally prefer using a hormonal uh, contraceptive that includes estrogen, like a, a birth control pill or patch or vaginal ring. We now have a, a one-year vaginal ring, Anavera, in those women that are still a little bit too young to have their ovaries and tubes out, which will reduce ovarian cancer risk, and, and but still aren't ready to give up their reproductive capacity and have such major surgery. Um, so tell us a little bit about Nexplanon, what your training is, how often you put them in, what women seem to like that as a long-acting reversible LARC contraceptive. Absolutely. Um, the next one on is a three-year progestin-only birth control option that gets inserted into the arm underneath the skin. You're able to feel it with your hand when you palpate that end of the arm. Um, it's very popular for patients that are concerned about the insertion of the IUD and the painful aspect of their tolerance also with pain. Um, and for patients that can't remember to take a pill every day or can't have estrogen for whatever reason, if they've had like a a blood clot or elevated blood pressure if they get migraines with aura or something like that that um, inhibits them from or if they're a smoker and over the age of 35 if they aren't able to take estrogen as a birth control method then a lot of women um, will choose the next one on it's a very easy in the office procedure we use um, a numbing medication lidocaine first that's usually the most um, if you want to say painful pinchy part um, it's a pinch and a burn quickly, and then that's over, and then patients don't feel anything after that. It gets inserted. We put steri strips so we don't suture anything, and they're good after that. I, they have to use backup contraception for the first seven days to ensure that it starts to work from a pregnancy prevention standpoint. The next one on, I, it's, you know, with a lot of different birth controls, it's very hit or miss on their response for the patient. Some women, um, it's probably my... My largest um, complaint of abnormal bleeding after insertion, but it, it does, there's plenty of patients that are like, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me, and they've been on their fourth one and they haven't had any issues. Um, if the they, training for it. If they stop their period, like say with mm -hmm. injectable uh, Depo Provera, which is another potentially long acting reversible contraceptive agent that now women can give themselves, they don't have to come into the clinic, right? Yes. But mm -hmm. with more than two years of Depo Provera, um, you're supposed to consider taking, checking their bone density because you could suppress their estrogen. Is there that same recommendation with Implanon if they're like on their fourth one? So they're going on like what, 12 years of being yeah, on? Yeah, no, they don't have that recommend. They don't have that recommendation at this time, but it would be something to consider. You know, it's a newer birth control that's on the market. I don't know if there's any really long term studies with that that have that um, bone thinning record or bone thinning inf information out there um, but at this time it is not a recommendation to change it or to get bone densities at um, after a few year mark so do you find your patients come back at that three-year mark to have them removed and either get a new one or get pregnant or do something else um, yeah, it's kind of all over the place. So the FDA says it's approved for three years, but if you got your um, next one on inserted at Planned Parenthood, they'll say it's good for five. So I have some patients that will come in and tell me that they've had it for X amount of years. And depending on weight fluctuation and things like that, they can be pretty difficult to move or to remove, excuse me. They're, the um, end of the rod gets encapsulated with tissues and things like that. So it takes a second to get them out. So I'd prefer for patients to do it on the three years F as the FDA has approved. But um, yes, I have a lot of patients that get them removed and replaced. I have plenty of patients that get them removed because they're wanting to conceive or change options. Or they'll say, you know, I got that inserted when I was 17 because I couldn't remember the pill every day, but I liked how it helped my acne more. So now that I'm 21, I feel like I'm more responsible and I would like that out, but to switch methods, it just depends on what the patient wants and their preference. Mm -hmm. Well, it's nice to have so many options. Where do you utilize the self-injection or office injection of the Depo Provera? So it just depends on also patients' comfort, how comfortable they are with injecting something themselves. 
depending on the person and um, you know, a lot of, we see a lot of nurses, we see a lot of healthcare professionals or patients that have a family member or a friend that's a healthcare professional that they feel comfortable with them injecting the medication for themselves. They're able to do that at home. There is now even like a sub Q injection for depo also that isn't as more painful because most of them have been intramuscular. Um, <clears throat> so I just tell patients whatever their comfort level is. If they have any concern or if they're at all um, hesitant because they are concerned that they might screw it up somehow, then they are more than welcome to come into the office. They can go to any Cleveland Clinic um, facility where there's a nurse there. They just need a nurse visit. They do not need to see myself or a clinician. They just scheduled the nurse visit. They go to the pharmacy and pick up the depot themselves because we do not hold it in the offices. And they pick that up and bring it to the um, appointment and then they'll get it injected and go on their way for the next uh, three months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's so great to have different options. The only, one thing about depot Rivera, I know we had a nurse in our center who said she was on it uh, when she was a young woman and she'd gained like so much weight. And it was because to see her now, she's so athletic and she's always been athletic. You'd never think that. So that kind of steers me a little bit away from it. But then I have seen women who don't have any weight gain and they just love it. So everybody's body is different. But when they go without a period, especially when they're perimenopausal, I really do like to check the FSH and the estradiol levels. And even though some women like long acting contraceptives because they can't remember to take a pill every day, they, if they are perimenopausal, they can remember to add a patch once a week or take estrogen if they're having hot flashes, which would then help their bones if they're, they're perimenopausal, which in perimenopause and just in women in general with the uterus, the uterus is made to bleed. Can you give us a little bit of guidelines? Cause I know you help me in my practice a lot with, uh, women who need annual evals, who sometimes just want their prescription as opposed to coming in or people having a little bleeding cause they skipped a pill, but we really want to rule out endometrial cancer. Um, and so I know you keep a really strong eye on that. And our um, lead nurse, um, Alexandria De Los Santos, who handles a lot of our my chart messages, uh, kind of keeps an, an iron fist. And so do you want to say why that's like helpful that we, we do this? It's for the patient's benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. So your biggest concern with anything, if, if anybody's having abnormal bleeding, you know, endometrial cancer is the percentage isn't high, but it is a risk. So you wanna make sure and rule that out completely with an endometrial biopsy. You know, a lot of times, depending on what the situation is, sometimes we will just get the ultrasound to look at the endometrial lining and see how thick it is. If it's too thick for, depending on the age of the person, we will get a biopsy at that time. A lot of times I just have them do the biopsy with the ultrasound, with which, which is called a saline infused sonogram so that we can have that um, reassurance that the pathology of the biopsy is negative, as well as getting a look at the lining of the uterus and the ovaries and everything to make sure that everything looks okay, depending on their bleeding. Um, I do have some patients that would rather not get the SIS done, and I've sent them to Dr. Sutherland for a full DNC to make sure that everything looks okay and that they want to um, just ensure that way that their everything is negative. Um, it just depends also on the risk of the patient. And I check things like their thyroid and their vitamin levels and things when they are having some abnormal bleeding just because some things can contribute in different ways. Um, but yes, to make sure that it's not any type of endometrial car cancer, which is our biggest concern with that bleeding. Even yeah. the smallest amount of bleeding. I know a lot of patients are like, but it was just a drop when I was wiping once. But uh -huh. it's really important to make sure that it's not um, something more serious. Yeah, I think that's very important. Even infections, hormonal imbalance, hyperplasia, precancer, and we just don't want to miss the cancers. And I think that since our approach with younger women is we don't necessarily make them get a pelvic exam and a pap to get contraception because, you know, we want them to have that op opportunity to, to control their ovaries. Um, but once you're over 40, uh, you know, some of the rules change a little bit and we have to be more vigilant. And uh, certainly in anybody with a family history of ovarian cancer, but even without it, I have seen ovarian, uh, I've seen ovarian and uterine cancers and cervical cancers in women that can cause abnormal bleeding. So um, also tell us why yeah. it's good to touch base with um, your healthcare clinician for your yearly, your yearly refills, like you're on hormone therapy, you're not having any problems, but you still need to check in or you're on a contraceptive agent, long acting or on a daily pill or weekly patch basis. Why is it that women do need to plan ahead and make that yearly appointment in advance of running out of their refills? 
It is important just because a lot happens in a year. A lot happens to the patient. They may have been diagnosed with something that their option that they've been on isn't appropriate for them anymore and they need, we need to switch it up. And you know, a lot of women get upset if that is the case because that option has worked for them for so long. And there are different things that we can look into to see if there was something that provoked the incident that maybe we need not, we now need to switch their um, options and take out the estrogen or add a different way of admi or administration or something like that. It's important to check in yearly because you know there's plenty of times that when I'm chart prepping there will be like a a minimal. Um, increase in their blood pressure recently, and it's probably due to anxiety or, you know, whatnot. But if they're on a combined pill, then we can switch them to something with progestin. Or if they're postmenopausal, then we can offer them a patch to bypass the liver. And there's just a lot of different options out there that um, can just help the patients based on their long-term health and help reduce risk, which is the most important because it's their benefit. It ha I mean, I love to see them every year as well. I like to make sure they're doing okay, see how everything's going. Um, and it's we're not just doing it just to be a thorn in the side or prevent giving medications. It's actually a very large benefit for them and their health to make sure that they're safe. Yeah, I tell patients that we have to see you either in person, virtually, um, in the practice, you know, at least at least once a year. And I certainly allow my patients to just click on my face and schedule their own virtual. And you just started to do that as well, too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just started that. And so I just think that... Um, with all the healthcare shortages we have, um, you know, with nursing, which is, has been critical. In fact, you've been so great because you've spent a lot of your free time when you should be traveling and hiking and enjoying your life. And you've actually worked in the hospital, you know, um, with your, with your RN, you know, degree as well, filling in and taking care of patients. And, um, that I just think that to, I always tell all my patients it's easier to cancel an appointment than make it. So like make it in make it in advance, and that you're really worth it as a, as a as a woman. And things do change, and there are new guidelines, and you do a lot of anticipatory health counseling too, and referrals to other people in our center. Uh, and I know you work closely. Um, and you've written a column on polycystic ovary condition, which I think we're going to have to have you come back for to dive into that. But I would encourage all of our listeners to go on speakingofwomenshealth.com. Uh, we have a lot of uh, contraceptive resources. Um, we have articles on when you see a physician versus your nurse practitioner or, uh, or physician assistant. Um, Dana has authored columns on IUDs and PCOS and... Um, Dana took over for uh, Mary Clarkin, who many of you uh, may know. She was a, one of the first women's health practitioners in Northeast Ohio, actually. She paved the way for a lot of people, and she's got lots of good content information on the website as well, including some of her recipes and information on, on self-defense and, and other interesting topics. So it's a, it's a good place to go for great information, and I just really want to thank Dana Leslie, Certified Nurse Practitioner, uh, for being part of our team and for sharing your expertise and your knowledge today in the Sunflower House. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and honor to work with you so closely, and I really appreciate all the um, questions that you answer for me every day on a daily basis and allowing me to be here with you today. Well, that's just what's so great about having an interdisciplinary center because we all kind of work together as a team and I hope to have some other team members on our podcast. I had Lily McKinney who was my long-term um, nurse who just retired and uh, she came in the other day uh, for Dr. Khan's birthday and she looks like she's really enjoying retirement so I think I'm going to have to have her back to talk about that because we really do encourage just like we encourage amongst ourselves also of course our patients to have very balanced lives to be strong be healthy and be in charge which is our motto so thank you so much for joining us in the sunflower house we were talking to dana leslie a nurse practitioner who is expert in women's health and annual women's health and gynecologic exams and she's also procedurally competent in terms of iud insertions and nexplanon insertions and endometrial biopsies which are for most women, not too much more than a pap smear and help screen for conditions in the uterus. Uh, and if you enjoy our nonprofit, Speaking of Women's Health, you can go on the website, speakingofwomenshealth.com, and click the donate button. We really appreciate that. I want to thank our executive 
uh, producer Lee Klekar. And uh, if you don't already subscribe, subscribe on Rumble. We're speakingwomenshelp.com. Go anywhere you listen to podcasts and subscribe to the free Speaking of Women's Health podcast. And please give us a five-star rating. And I hope you'll join us back in the Sunflower House for our next edition. <music>